Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Quote Shakespeare Hamlet. Today we're going to finish up Act 1 with Act 1, Scene 5. What I do in this series is I first give you a quick nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and then we dive deeply into the text of each scene and pull out five quotes that I think are really useful to help you understand the play's character and themes. After quite a suspenseful build-up, Hamlet finally gets to meet the ghost of his father on the battlements of the castle late at night, and King Hamlet reveals that Claudius murdered him and commands his son to avenge the murder. Hamlet, of course, swears revenge, otherwise there'd be no play. Then Hamlet returns to Horatio and Marcellus, and he tells these guys that he is going to pretend to be insane. Now, it's kind of, it, it's important that, this fact is important, because we all throughout the play from now on we don't quite know whether Hamlet really is insane or whether or not he's just pretending so keep that in mind because that's going to become important later. So the first thing to say about Act 1 Scene 5 is in regard to its function as part of the plot. It is the announcement of the initiating incident. The initiating incident is the event that kicks off the events of the entire um, story and when you're dealing with a revenge genre story you need some kind of crime. You need That's the initiating incident. So, there, so he announces the father comes and he says I am thy father's spirit and he announces um, the, the the need for revenge. He announces that there was a murder. Okay, uh, this this little bit here. Uh, don't worry about it too much. It's lots of spooky fun. Remember, this is a Hollywoody movie. Sh Hamlet's uh, Shakespeare's trying to make money. Fair enough. And and he's 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 pandering to an audience, not necessarily in a bad way, in a fun way. Um, that that believes in ghosts and so here's a ghost on stage so why not let's pause a little bit and have some fun enjoying the presence of this this terrible ghost okay so the father does arrive and he says you must revenge his uh, my foul and most unnatural murder hamlet's ears prick up yes murder most foul now hamlet says okay tell me right away so that i with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge now that's incredibly ironic because we know that there's, there's nothing sweeping about hamlet's actions his thoughts are the only thing his his, his erratic thoughts are the only things that that sweep to and fro uh, he is the great ditherer of course so there's, there's a wonderful irony you can talk about in class now this next quote I think is important because it announces something that I've talked about before I do believe that ha King Hamlet was an overbearing father he might have been a, 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 a great king he might have been a, a good husband uh, but in the shadow of that greatness stands the boy and and I think Hamlet is we've talked about already is not uh, a politically minded guy he's not a murderer by any stretch well yeah yeah he is but he's he's not he doesn't have the courage to do it uh face to face he's, he's not a warrior type do you see um although he might be vicious as as we will see later on anyway so the father the father says i find the apt it's like good you're ready to do this murder does he really know his son would he say that if he really understood his son would he say that i find you suited to this challenge and ready for this challenge if he knew anything about his dreamy introspective philosophical poetic dramatic son I don't think he would find him apt at all he'd be suspicious of Hamlet's crazy yes dad let me tell me what to do and I'll do it anyway so he says uh, and duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed that rots itself in ease on Lethe wharf Lethe is the is the river of forgetfulness in Hades wouldst thou not stir to this so if you're not going to stand up and do anything like this then you're basically you know you're you're, you're sleepwalking through life or you're, you're dead to life so it's it's not it's not a terribly damning quote i mean fair enough there, there's there was a terrible crime and the father does want some kind of justice but he he, he it, it, it's a it's a heavy burden to put on a son that i don't think well obviously he's not up to this task and that reflects badly on the on the father who would do you see who would who would demand this of the son? So that's something to think about. And again, there's more evidence throughout the play. We can we can see it in several different different places in the play. And you can put your own uh, you can put your own thesis together because there's, you could argue against this as well. And then King Hamlet drops the bombshell, which is, but that but know thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. Oh my prophetic soul, my uncle. So Hamlet all along had a suspicion that his uncle was up to no good, and now he has some kind of confirmation. It's not real confirmation, of course, because we know that Hamlet and, Bo and Horatio are very skeptical of the ghost, because, as we've said, the ghost could be the devil in disguise come to trick Hamlet to his doom. So, But he has half confirmation, and that half is important because the half of it is what determines the whole play. The whole play is about a guy who dithers, 
who can't make up his mind, and that's one of the reasons why he can't make up his mind, because he doesn't know who to trust, not even the ghost of his father. Well, not the ghost of his father. Okay, so then King Hamlet goes on to lament and rail against his younger brother Claudius and his wife Gertrude. Well, he doesn't say that much about Gertrude, but, um, but yeah, he, he, well, he, he, taught, he, he reveals himself as being arrogant and overbearing, I think, and he reveals a bit of puritanical uh, a, a, a puritanical streak that I think Hamlet inherited. So let's have a look. He says, "Oh, what a falling off was there from me, whose love was that of was of that dignity that it went hand in hand, even with the vow I made to her in marriage." So the love that I bore her, the love that she left, was this high and noble love. And to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine. Now think. It's really useful to do this thought experiment. When you're, when you're trying to understand a character uh, in a great work of literature, ask yourself, how would you feel in this situation? How would you feel if you had an older brother or older sister that felt like this, that you were a wretch and, and your talents were poor compared to, compared to theirs? Uh, not great, not great at all. So I'm not saying that Shakespeare is building any sympathy for Claudius into this play. He's building understanding that's what great art does. It doesn't condemn. It says, this is what human beings do. And the actions were absolutely horrific, but we kind of know why, why he did it. Uh, the Cain and Abel story in the Christian tradition, the Cain and Abel story uh, reflects this very, very well. Cain committed the first murder in humankind, and he murdered his older brother, probably out of uh, some kind of resentment. Okay, So I, I think the tone here too, he's right to be angry because he was murdered by the guy. So he's right to be angry. But the tone here and the way, do you see this part here? His natural gifts were poor to those of mine. His whole life he thought he was better than Claudius, do you see? And Claudius knew it. He knew it. Um, so I think uh, overbearing, arrogant. This next little part, uh, I think, reveals his, his puritanical nature. Now, remember what we talked about with the Hyperion sun god, the Apollonian Apollo, god of Apollo, the god of reason and the intellect, the higher powers. Those energies are important. The lower energies, the, 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 the bestial energies, the beast in us that involves, uh, uh, you know, just pure body pleasures and pains and everything else, that's part of who we are as well. And when you try to divorce the two, as I'm going to argue later on, when, when a person tries to live purely in one realm or the other, you get a kind of schizophrenic crack up. The healthiest people are the people that integrate both aspects of themselves because they're both very, very real and they must be respected. The ancient Greeks and Shakespeare, as we see here, understood both, uh, understood that very, very well. So here's what he says in that regard. He says, but virtue as it never will be moved, though lewdness courted in the shape of heaven, so lust, though to a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. So the virtuous love will never submit to lewdness, even though lust, mere bestial lust, even though uh, uh, virtue is courted by those, those beast powers within us, it will never be moved. It will never change. True virtue is true virtue, okay? Likewise, pure lust is just pure lust and can never rise above it. Even though an angel, even though it is linked to an angel, even though, the, the, even though lust is linked to an angel, it, it still... It's, it's a kind of garbage. It is, it is a kind of trash. Um, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's terribly healthy. There might be a bit of truth in it. Uh, Shakespeare wrote one of his sonnets uh, about, uh, a, a couple of sonnets about, um, about sexual pleasure that is divorced from any kind of love. Um, I do believe that Shakespeare, as revealed through his sonnets and some of his other plays, he did see love. The marriage of true minds is the first line in one of his sonnets. And I think it comes out again and again and again in Romeo and Juliet especially, uh, where he does believe in some kind of spiritual love. And I, I'm not talking about necessarily religious love, but some kind of something, something that, that is above the, the bodily functions. However, the healthy per people, like Romeo and Juliet, can enjoy both. They accept that both exist, and Romeo and Juliet uh, in capture that as well. Here we see the father, no, he's clearly divorced the two. There's something different about the, the noble, virtuous love and lower energy love. Now, you don't want to be married to either guy either. You don't want to be married to a beast, and you don't want to be married to this prig who lives up in this, up in this ivory tower of a mind all the time. So it, it's, it's a, this, is a, this is a play about unhealthy <laughs> mental attitudes. And here we see the father presenting it. And I think this is where Hamlet gets his problems as well, as we're going to see 
later on in the play. King Hamlet then describes the manner of his murder. He says, while sleeping in my orchard, my brother came and he poured, uh, he poured a poison in my ear and it, and, it, and it killed him. So that's basically all you need to know for that. But again, it's, there's a bit of Hollywood description here. It's kind of fun. So listen to it for the poetry. You should have watched the movie. Now there's two quotes or two short quotes that I think are quite revealing coming up very, very soon. He says, in that way, thus was I sleeping by a brother's hand of life of crown of queen at once dispatched. So I lost everything by my brother's hand cut off even in the blossoms of my sin now that's really really important too because in the in the christian tradition uh if if you die without having absolution if a priest hasn't come and blessed you and and, and given you a chance to 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 repent your your sins then you have a hard time getting into heaven you don't necessarily go to hell in my understanding uh but you end up in something like purgatory which is where ghosts go ghosts can't go to heaven, they can't go to hell necessarily. They kind of stuck in this never never land of, of purgatory. And that's where that's where King Hamlet is right now. Now that's important because later on actually uh, Hamlet does have uh, an opportunity to kill uh, Claudius because Claudius is there alone in a room and Claudius is praying and Hamlet comes up behind him and he says, now might I do it, Pat? Oh, well, here's I hear I can do it. But then Hamlet says, no, I'm not gonna do it because if I kill him now while he's praying to God, he goes straight to heaven. And he threw my father down into pur or over into purgatory because my father didn't have a chance to repent of his sins. So he says that's not that's not revenge. That's actually a gift. I'm 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 giving my 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 murderous uncle a gift of 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 heaven. So he's not going to do that. So do you see the problem? It's Hamlet the thinker. Hamlet smart. Now if that was a non-thinker, he'd walk into the room, he'd see the King Claudius vulnerable, and he would stick a knife in his back without thinking at all. But that's not the kind of guy Hamlet is. He's smart, he's a thinker, not a doer, and therefore he's paralyzed by thought, and therein lies the tragedy. It, right to the end of the play, he can't do anything because he thinks about these, these possibilities too much. There's the great theme of thought versus action. Too much, too, many, too much thinking can lead to paralysis. Almost horrible, horrible, horrible. He can't believe what he's hearing. Uh, the father then says, you have to get revenge, okay? And, and at the, at the, his last words are, adieu, 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 remember me. Now, I put this in here because I think it, it, it does, it adds to, to, to Hamlet's pressure. If you are a parent and you really, really, really want to mess up your kids, the best way to do it is on your deathbed, make them swear a solemn promise that is really going to be hard for them to keep. That's what, father, that's, what, that's what Hamlet's father does. He says, remember me. Now, those words will never be forgotten by a child, ever. Those kinds of promises can stick with a kid forever, and they can ruin the kid's life. So the kid is saddled now with a duty, do you see? The kid now, on the deathbed of their parent, they promise to fulfill their duty in society. Parents often represent society, you see. Forget the self, the kid will spend the rest of their life denying their true nature and they'll be following the whims of, the, not the whims, following the, the desires of the parent and not the desires of the self. Now that's a wasteland, that's a wasteland. Duty versus the self. Brutal, There's a, they're from beyond the grave. Parental interference from beyond the grave. Every single adult figure in this story is, is, is overbearing is is intrusive into their kids lives it's absolutely brutal so don't say this if you have kids someday um i forgot to mention this this is actually quite important this reveals something about the father as well that makes him even more confusing he says of gertrude he says leave your mother alone don't touch her don't don't taint not thy mind nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother at all don't l leave her to heaven tender loving husband that sounds like that's what he is, and yet why does why is Gertrude so quick to marry Claudius if he was such a great uh, husband? I don't. Weird. There, there you go. There, that's that's those are people. We're complex. We're we're, we're crazy creatures. Anyway, uh, remember me, remember me. Of course, Hamlet does. Right in the very next line, the ghost disappears, and Hamlet says, "Remember thee, yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe all." Away, wipe away all trivial fond records. I'll forget everything from the past. I will just do my duty to you. So Hamlet is now trapped, trapped by the by the by the needs of the of the parent. That's the the Malfoy trapped by the father who's trapped by Voldemort. There's the tyrant, Voldemort the tyrant, who con the consuming parent 
who swallows up the soul, the energies of the young for their own benefit. Duty, self versus society, parental interference from beyond the grave. This also reveals that Hamlet is the all or nothing thinker. Remember, he's an idealist. He refuses to accept complexity in people. If you've got one little speck of corruption in you, which we all do, then that's intolerable. Then you are beyond the pale. Uh, he, he feels that about himself, too. That's why he's filled with self-hate. So there's, there's Hamlet, the all or nothing thinking. He can't just calmly stand back and say, okay, yeah, okay, now I've got these other things to do, and now I've got to get revenge as well. Okay, fine. He can't do that. He just jumps right into the revenge. Uh, these are great quotes, too. Oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain. The hypocrisy theme. I could have added the hypocrisy theme here. Those, those, that's quite important. Smiling villain. That's an oxymoronic phrase, and that captures quite nicely uh, the grand theme of hypocrisy throughout this whole play. That one may smile and smile and be a villain. Now look around your life. You've seen the smiling villains. Maybe you have a bit of a smiling villain in you as well. Adieu, adieu, remember me, Hamlet repeats. And then Horatio and Marcellus enter. And um, just to wrap up the scene, uh, Hamlet just summarizes what happens that he, he spoke to the ghost. Um, he says he makes the, 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 the two guys promise not to reveal what he had seen there that night. And then off stage, the voice of the ghost booms, you know, swear, swear. So again, there's the domineering voice of the father uh, extending beyond the, the, the son to control everybody. So domineering king. We don't quite know. Um, anyway, so just to wrap things up. Hamlet says, wow, this is all pretty strange, isn't it? And then Hamlet says this famous line, with that, which I think I should point out to you because it's very famous, and you'll hear it uh, as you go through life. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Philosophy here would mean more uh, something like we would understand science. So here's this, this, this uh, insistence on something beyond the physical world. Now, this is actually important. He says to them, he says, uh, guys, don't freak out. If you see me acting strange, I'm going to put on antic disposition. And I said that once, or I'll say it again. Don't I will put on antic dispositions. I'm going to act crazy, okay? But don't worry, I have a plan. He doesn't explain what this plan is, and the only thing that I can figure is that he he puts he pretends to be crazy so that nobody would suspect him of of watching them very very carefully. He's wa he's observing these people and he's planning his moves and he has to kind of uh it's kind of a camouflage is what it is. Okay. Um yeah, and that's that's it. The father again, he's we'll swear you three um to do this and they all have to swear. And then Hamlet says something very sad, rest rest perturbed spirit. I mean, here's the heart the the, the son's heart breaking. His father was murdered. And obviously Hammond loved and looked up to his son god father. It's so terrible. So gentlemen, with all my love, I do commend me to you. So he needs his buddies. He's going to ask them for help. And what so poor a man as Hamlet is, may I do everything in my power to befriend you and to, and to fulfill my duty. So there's, there's Hamlet with a bit of a, you know, the bit of self-hate and, 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 uh, and not a lot of confidence. And of course, this quote is very, very important. He says, the time is out of joint. So there's the wasteland theme. I should have put the wasteland theme up here as well. The time is out of joint. That's a clear indication of the wasteland. O cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. So there's him. He is the failed hero. We know that from, from having watched the movie. Um, he's the wrong man for the job. Self-hate, parental interference with the swearing duty, self versus society, revenge. He is born to put it right. He is in thrall to forces beyond his control. His life is not his own. His life is his duties, his father's societies. Sad. And that's the end of Five Quotes Shakespeare Hamlet Act One. Come back for my next video when I start Act Two. Thanks for watching.